I am president of Science Europe. Uh, I'm also the chief executive of one of the research councils in the UK. So for those who don't know, the UK has seven research councils um, rather than just one. And I'm the chief executive of the Social Sciences Research Council. It's called the Economic and Social Research Council. Um, <clears throat> Science Europe, though, and I suspect that's more likely why I was invited today, uh, is an organization which brings together 51 of the funding agencies across Europe. So these are research funding agencies, but also research performing agencies, the Max Planck Institute in Germany, as well as the DFG, for example, um, representing agencies from something like 26 countries. Um, and those agencies have a very substantial spend on research every year. So we're talking somewhere around 30 billion euros spent each year by those 50 or so agencies uh, to push forward the research endeavor. Science Europe itself represents those agencies and we try to work hard both to take a lead in scientific uh, discovery. So what can we do as a set of organizations to identify where the big research gaps are? How do we decide where we should prioritize our spend? But we also have something of a policy role and we spend a lot of time in the interface between the funding agencies that we represent and, for example, the European Commission. We do a lot of work in partnership with the Commission. A lot of the things that we do, we work on jointly. Some of the things we work on separately, but it depends on the topic, of course. Um, I thought what I would do is, is just perhaps raise a, a few of the points that are burning issues for Science Europe and, and for the members of Science Europe. And I guess we need to reflect among those which of them are particularly relevant to trying to engage with the media. Um, some of them, I think, are the sorts of topics which will interest researchers, funding agencies, and people in the commission. But I suspect the general public is happy to see these issues dealt with by us. There are many other issues, I think, though, that we're grappling with at the moment that really are extremely topical and do deserve, I, I think, a better engagement with the media, a better engagement with the public about some of the dilemmas we're facing. So let me start with some of the issues perhaps that are, are of more interest to Science Europe, uh, I guess, uh, and indeed the European Commission. It seems to me that we're meeting at an absolutely vital time. Horizon 2020 has been put forward. Uh, of course, there was a request for 80 billion euros. Um, I think that the deal at the moment is just over 70 billion, but we still have to wait and hear what the European Parliament will argue for. Science Europe's view is it's absolutely vital that we spend as much of the monies that were requested as possible on science in Europe. There are very few things that we can invest money in that have been demonstrated to help with economic growth. And investing in science and research is one of the few areas that you can clearly make the link between that investment and subsequent growth in times of austerity. If that's the case, then it clearly makes sense for us to prioritize spend in that area to a reasonable degree. Um, and that's the common view, I think, of all of our Science Europe members, that we strongly support the budget that Horizon 20 has, 20 has put forward. Of course, within that, it would be our view that there is no sense at all in spending huge sums of public money on science if we don't make sure that science is the most excellent science possible. So we would strongly agree with the stress in Horizon 2020 on excellence. We need to make sure that Europe is competing worldwide. If we're going to make use of the research we do, it has to be of global impact. It has to be the best research. It will be mediocre research is no use to anybody. Having said that, it's also vital that we make sure that we do a good job of capacity building. Capacity building will lead to the excellence of the future. The two are not separate. And we need to think cleverly in Europe about how we go about fulfilling both those functions. There's no question that there are some elite parts of Europe at the moment that are leading in scientific terms. There's also no question that there are growing developments across the whole of Europe that we need to encourage. So it seems to me that a balanced picture, one that somehow embeds research excellence and capacity building needs to be struck. And of course this speaks not only to the funds that have been put into Horizon 2020, but also to the funds that are set aside for structural development, cohesion funding and so on. We need to do a much better job in the future of thinking about how some of those funds might be positioned in a way to build capacity in areas where capacity is as yet not as strong in some other parts of Europe. I think we need to think carefully about some of the mechanisms within Horizon 2020 itself. I think the, uh, the, the proposal for, our, for Horizon 2020 is an excellent one. 
I think the Commission listened. I think they've made some really substantial developments since the last framework program. And there's some areas where I think most researchers and indeed funding agencies would agree substantial progress has been made. However, a lot of that progress at the moment is just words. We've got to wait and see how some of this is delivered. So for example, Horizon 2020 will aim to be much more simplified than previous frameworks. Whether that can be achieved is going to be challenging. It's great to aim for that, but we've got to see how it will actually be put in practice. We also know uh, that there's various other elements of Horizon 2020 where, for example, it's been argued we should embed social science and humanities throughout each of the thematic challenges. I think that's an absolutely excellent idea. I think many researchers agree, but achieving it is not a simple task. These are the sorts of things we need to grapple with. Thinking about the topic of this conference, it seems to me that we need to be thinking cleverly about what we mean about research and innovation. There's a temptation to separate the two sometimes. There's also temptation to think about innovation in a rather traditional, linear fashion, where we think about scientists in the lab developing an idea and somehow then gradually taking that idea to a company who then delivers it to the public. The reality, the research shows that it's extremely rare for science and innovation to work in that way. It's a much more dynamic interaction, it's much more fluid, it's much more circular, and it certainly isn't the case that research only happens at the beginning. We need research throughout that process, including research into how we engage with the public and how we put our ideas out there. So I think when we think cleverly about what is described in this conference about responsible uh, research and innovation, we have to really grapple with these concepts of research, innovation, and get away from the idea of this being a pipeline that we just imagine working in a very li linear, traditional way. In addition to that, I think we have to think extremely carefully about the role of social innovation. Yes, we need technological innovation. Yes, we need new inventions. But when 70% of many economies re revolves around the service sector, there's a huge impact coming nowadays from social innovations, totally different sorts of innov innovative ways of working, the Wikipedias of this world, the open source software of this world, things that happen in a bottom-up way and something that we need to grapple with a little bit more. As funders, I think we also need to grapple with the issue of top-down versus bottom-up research. I absolutely agree that there's a place for both. In my view, some of the biggest achievements have come from top-down initiatives. If you think about getting a man on the moon or grappling with the HIV AIDS crisis, we would never have made the achievements we did without a concerted attempt by a range of funders to put money into an area where it's felt we needed huge funding. However, in my view, it's also crucial to make sure we have bottom-up research coming through. The ERC is one example of that, but there are many other examples in the national funding agencies who fund what we at the ESRC, my research council, would call responsive mode funding. Allowing blue skies ideas to come from the researchers themselves will lead to innovations that none of the people developing the top-down ideas will have thought of. So we must make sure there's a place for both. The final point that I suppose is a critical area for funding agencies at the moment, and indeed for the European Commission, is we have to think very carefully about how we as funders promote the best research. I like to talk about borderless science. I think one of my jobs as a research funder is to make sure that the people I'm funding find it as easy as possible to work with the best minds in the world wherever they might be. We need to move away from thinking about funding within retained borders, and that means in the European context supporting the European research area, encouraging grants to be mobile, and indeed researchers to be mobile within the European Union. But more broadly, of course, it means being mobile across the world. It means interacting with researchers across the world. Science should be borderless. It shouldn't be just in the national prerogative. And then there's some areas which I think are perhaps of more immediate interest to the media and to the public and are likely to stir up more concern. One of them, I was in a session earlier this morning, is an open access. And at the moment, we're grappling in many countries with open access to publications, to journal articles. But of course, there's a deeper question as well of open access to data and so on. In my view, open access has to be the way forward. And we've got to think cleverly about coming up with a way of changing the current system. My personal view is we have to move away from a subscription-based model to an author pays model for articles. We want articles to be freely available to the public as soon as possible. These are articles generated by the taxpayer, by the public purse, and as a result, they shouldn't be hidden away in journals that academics, and indeed not all academics, depending on the journal, but academics have access to and many other members of the public, 
in the business sector, in the media and elsewhere, do not get free access. I think it's vital that we move to a system where the work we do is as freely available as possible. The second area I think is crucial is around gender. I think there was another session, unfortunately, I couldn't attend on gender at this conference. There's some very interesting research has come out of the United States recently which helps explain why women are not performing as well in academia, in the key research positions. Yes, part of it, of course, is that women struggle because their careers are often shorter than those of men's. But the work done in America proves that there, there retains gender bias. There are gender biases in promotion. And that gender bias, interestingly, comes from both men and women on appointing panels. So we need to think really hard about how we grapple with that bias. If I take the example of Science Europe, when we set ourselves up, we were determined to make sure that women were as represented as possible on our governing board, which has around 12 members. There's one woman. And the reason why there's only one woman is the rules of our organization state that the members of the governing board have to be the heads of the research councils. They have to be running a research council in their country or a, a research performing organization in their country. And unfortunately, when you look across Europe, there are very, very few women in those positions. So we were trapped in a position where we couldn't appoint women according to the rules of our organization. And we will be looking carefully about how we work around that in the future. And then another point is on research integrity. Research integrity is going to become, I think, one of the biggest issues that we have to grapple with as scientists. We've seen many, many examples of scientists fabricating evidence, of putting out misleading results, and there are some quite difficult examples where this has involved clinical trials, where children and others may have been subjected to drugs in cases where those drugs have not been properly tested. Now, I say there are many examples, and that if you look worldwide, there are. Of course, in day-to-day -day science, there are very few. If you look at the proportion of scientists involved in fabricating or putting out false evidence, it's extremely marginal. But even so, I think as a community, we really are going to have to make sure that we put in place the most clear and well-structured governance systems to try and make sure that this is not uh, allowed. Ethics committees and, and other things are the sorts of things that many uh, funding agencies and institutions use, but it's not widespread, it's not consistent, and we need to think carefully about how we, we make progress there. Finally, we also have to engage with the public. I, I've listened a little bit to the conference. I think there's been an assumption we don't do a good enough job. My personal opinion is that many funding agencies and many universities actually do an exceptionally good job of engaging with the public in many ways, but we can always do better. There will never be an end to this job. We can always improve. If I take my own research council, what do we do? Well, we have a, a full communications team. We run what we call the Festival for Social Science every year. This is a week-long event, 180 events scattered across the UK, 22,000 members of the public attend and listen to the best social science that's going on. This, I think, is a fantastic way of engaging with, this, with the public. It doesn't mean we've finished our job. It just means that this is one good example of how we can engage with a public who want to learn about the science that we're all engaged in. We also publish a magazine called Britain In. It's on the shelves of all of our major uh, retailers, so the public can purchase a magazine which is based entirely on the social science findings that we come across. These, I think, are good examples, but there are many other things that we should be doing, and I'd be interested to hear from the media and others about how we improve in this area. The final point I will say is it seems to me, that, and I haven't talked much about research, there are a range of areas in research where we've got to think carefully about how we engage with the public as we move forward. Many of the research topics that we've worked on for many years can be quite sensitive, but I think the public is becoming increasingly interested in that work, and we've got to think about how we engage with them. I could take, think of many examples, work around genetics and the genome. In my own field of expertise, the work around big data and making more use of, for example, the data that governments collect about individuals for research purposes. I'm utterly convinced we can do this in robust, well-governed ways, but I'm also convinced that if we do it in, without engaging with the public, we may, in the end, not succeed. We need the public to be on board with some of these areas. And again, I think this is a major area where we can engage with the media to engage with the public about some of the exciting things we could do and explain to the public about how we can achieve them. Critically, in any in public engagement, it's not just about us telling the public what we're doing and persuading them that we know what we're doing. 
It's also about allowing the public to help influence and shape what we do. It has to be a two-way relationship. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Boyle.